Th thank you, Claudia. I'm, I'll have to find out where you got some of that material. I, I could use it. <laughs> um, I, 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 uh, we were talking over supper, and I, I sort of had to admit that I, I sort of average a book every decade uh, of the poetry. Um, so I, I just thought I'd, I'd start off by reading a poem from each of the three books uh, that exist. Um, the back part of the first one, I, I had set myself the task of paying attention to the months as they passed, and I wrote a poem for each month. Uh, so I ended up with a calendar. Mm -hmm. And I've just had the impulse again in the last month or so. I, had, like, I haven't done it for, what is this, 30 years ago? <laughs> so I think I, I'm, I'm going to do it again, but this was the November I wrote quite a long time ago. Old Orange Jack has gotten rot inside since the night his face was glorious. Such dissipation is Indian summer that Jack for days has been deflating, all pride forgotten. Now tiny flies are blocking up the holes that are his eyes. The shifting dark in trees that feathered quarreling foliage that drops and slits the cold will be the last he sees. I, I, I've been noticing him a lot in the last week. <laughs> in the student village in, in Kingston, there, there was a lot of him about. Um, just just because uh, November 11th this week, I, I, I had a vague memory of this poem and thought I, I, sh I should read it. Um, from the second book, Poppies in November. The scarlet springtime blooming on lapels. Mother must have planted such flat kisses. They're not bouquets, frugal signals shining that solitarily, the very stopped and formal hearts for this failing day. Yet how rawly the little blots open up. They mouth a cry perpetually. Oh, when will they be nothing more than cloth? I'm so tempted to read the funny one. <laughs> I have, well, okay. The, uh, <laughs> read two, read the funny one and the other. <laughs> um, the, this, this one literally came to me. <laughs> I opened the mail and this object was in the mail and it made me so mad. <laughs> Somehow I was insulted by it, but the, and I threw it away. And I thought, wait a minute, that's a powerful piece of writing that I'm so upset about it. So I took it out of the garbage, and I rewrote it for my own purposes. <laughs> the Chain. This poem has come to bring you good luck. It is the original poem, not a copy. It has gone around the world nine times. Now the luck is on its way to you. It will reach you for days from now, provided you share this poem. This is no joke. Don't you want to get lucky? Read this poem to 20 who need good luck. Don't give money. Fate has no price. Don't keep this poem to yourself. It must leave your mouth within 99 hours. A Royal Air Force officer found a hundred thousand pounds after he read this poem to his men. <laughs> Joe Elliott made 40,000 in the markets, but he lost it again because he did not share this poem. <laughs> Six days after reading this poem in the Philippines, Gene Walsh lost his wife. 
He had failed to heed this poem and the cost of sending home her remains. Read this poem to 20 friends and see what happens after four days. This poem comes from near Oshwegan and was written by Daniel David Moses, one of the rare Delaware Indians. <laughs> this poem must be heard around the world. So read it to your associates and you will get a surprise. This will happen even if you're not superstitious. <laughs> Did you know that Constantine Blas read this poem in 1951? <laughs> he had asked his secretary to spread the word to his office staff something more than 20 souls. Four days later on two million from the lottery, he retired. Arla Dottet? A single office worker read this poem but forgot about it. On the fifth day, he lost his job. Later, he found this poem again and read it around, and three days later, got a better job and a girlfriend. <laughs> Dolan Fairchild read this poem and, not believing, threw it away. Nine days later, he was dead. Remember, share this poem. It brings good luck. Send no money. Don't ignore it. <laughs> Did it work? You will find out. <laughs> we'll all be dead. But what good luck is going to come to you now that you've read it? <laughs> to all of us. To all of us. I'm going to. Uh, read stuff from the manuscript that's with the publisher now and I'm hoping it will fit into next season. Um, the uh, title is A Small Essay on the Largeness of Light and Other Poems. Um, I had drafted a poem when I was in university trying to think about my relationship with my father. The poem that came up was adequate, but I never tried to publish it. I just thought it was probably not achieved. Um, my father passed away just over three years ago. I, I had remembered the poem when I noticed him starting to fail. and and sort of worked on it off and on. Um, I guess for maybe the last six years, say, uh, as he was getting more frail, moved into the old folks' home. Um, and, and after he left, I, I, I was able to finish this version of it. Um, so it it has the awkward title, Once Upon an Evening Out Along Sixth Line. Sixth Line is where we live on the reserve. Um, I'm out for my run at dusk instead of at dawn. Along the gravel road I used to bike to school and chance upon the old man, my father, also out at that hour taking his constitutional. Already he's so far ahead, silhouetted against the sunset, and apparently in such a mad hurry, strange in a guy over 80, I fear I won't ever be able to catch up. So I imagine Dad wanting to say hello, stopping and turning back, Though I know the night can't that easily be put on pause, though it's catching up with both of us, though my dad, like that, he's gone. My hope is to hurry where, to where I saw him last, to maybe stand again on the road's shoulder and catch the rough edge of his voice untangling itself, calling my name from these dark woods across the ditch. Nothing 
stirs, not even a hint of vitalis lingering to liven up the air. I keep on up the road, wonder where he's got to, still certain he has to be somewhere. That path overgrown now that led to the sand pit or out in the clearing the pit was before that where on summer mornings it used to be good mushroom picking where by night with luck you'd espy the brief pulse of fireflies from that fallow field with the sun down I know he'd see the Big Dipper, be able to follow its famous vector all the way to Polaris, and maybe remember the radio silent flight his PBY Catalina took the night nothing happened. His gunner sights on such stars and the tarmac in Iceland. He never said word one about any of those missions and had no comment on my handbook of the constellations. The boy who riffled through the pictures who saw on past the Big Dipper to the bear Ursa Major, now lifts up his eyes to a decondensing trail. He finishes my run, stumbling home in the dark, no longer sure that the road's up ahead, stars can't really be trusted, not like sons. So from now on, he plans to take his constitutional at dawn. Um, the, the, I was just obsessed with getting this poem written. Uh, it, 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 this is not a problem for me, usually, uh, but this was like, those teenage years, you, you sometimes get insomnia, and I just had this, this solid memory of just having, like, one night where I, I, sleep would not come. Um, buzz. It's not just me. There's also you. Both of us up and unable to take a break. You from buzzing that 10 watt bulb, me from being awake. Why do I think the two situations are linked? What do I care? The thought that a fly might be stuck in some facsimile of a tragic plot Electron and nucleus, the twain never to meet, ought not to bore me. Love, even one so meager, deserves, I was taught, a consummation. But what your motive toward the light gets from me is irritation. If you tick a against that glass once more. I'm afraid it might push me through one of the many new cracks in my old composure. Oh, tick again and the live wiring of my brain will short out. Electrons doing their bit for comedy. A sputtered climax, which would, yes, improve on this dead, ed, dead end we're in. I lay me down, praying you will tick once more. 
even while the buzz of reason reminds me that none of my prayers have been answered before. To calm me more, it questions why I don't try that switch by the door. I don't know anymore. I don't know. Even with my body so far away, it should be easy as breaking glass. A forefinger and a thumb made out of the darkness, pinching us out of existence. I've had the privilege, uh, a friend of mine taught at U of T Scarborough, and he had connections. Uh, uh, he, his family went back to the Czech Republic. So he did these projects where he would take his drama students to work with drama students in Prague. And we would, he invited me along on a couple of trips to put a show together. and. I got to translate some songs from Czech into English and actually supply some lyrics for, for uh, the songs that were done in the shows. So I know it's in here and I'm looking at the... <laughs> There it is. Okay. Second section. Yeah, no. I no, I I, I usually have the nakedness back the there. Nakedness. Not, not just a stack. Yeah, which you know, I, I actually have a table of contents, but I don't have it numbered, so. <laughs> um, Missing the contents. <laughs> so this is uh, the Orchard Song. And uh, it, it is, you know, in the show it is actually done with music and, and, a, and a refrain, but uh, I will just give you the lyrics. Um, Mostly because when I start thinking about the actual tune, I remember how the p composer kept explaining to me how lovely it was to write for lyrics in English because Czech was just too complicated. Um, anyway, uh, the Orchard Song. The farmer's son climbs up among the branches of the night. He's always dreamed of harvesting a moon so sweet, so ripe. His eyes are full of silver. He's always had far sight. Beyond his father's land he sees a city made of light. How many moons will be enough for him to leave the farm? All the taxes the land carries, the old man's broken bones the old man's eyes are water, that second kind of sight. Beneath the tree of night, he met a woman made of clay. The farmer's wife will lose her son. He'll tarnish in the town. He'll spend himself. He'll lose his way, counterfeiting the moon. The woman's eyes are oceans. She's always seen her boy climb up the tree of day at play, the apple of her eye. So rather than be an intent on finding one more, I'm just going to find one I want to read. <laughs> Thank you. 
same, same material as the last one, but a different take on it. Same, same. Um, moon of the wind fallen. The moon so ripe on its stem. He wants to be a kid and clamber through the branches of the tree of night again. Needs to look out through the topmost limbs at the illuminated farm, a harvest of many moons, as the saying goes, safe in a six-quart basket hung from his arm. How long did he think that harvest would last? How much did it profit him once he'd been taxed off the land, once he'd landed with his boots here on the pavement? How long, he's wondering, has it been that I've been here? So long he can no longer see the lights of the city flickering to fullness after sunset as anything other than counterfeit. The real moon's light, in his experience, never tarnished anything. These shadows thrown around him our branches no boy ever will climb. The old moon, this time round, rises to the zenith. The man enters the corner store, hungry for apples. And one more. Blues around a rearview mirror. Autumn's overripe sun dropped long ago. What a splash it made, what a mess. The moon, too new to float that long through the congealing, blackening wreck of November sky. Bright moat in the rear view. I now says adieu too. We two stuck behind the steering wheel with no time for goodbyes. Pass on, pass by. Facing the flowing highway night, the head and tail lights of other survivors. Meanwhile, our sighs are silvering the glass fogging the windshield too, into a mirror where our destination appears a ghost among stars. The maps here on my lap. Where are these abandoned barns, the land of dead elms? How will we cross all this driftwood at sea in shadows? Then pumpkins, the color of flame, a peripheral vision, buoy up from the deep blue field to the right. Hold tight, they seem to say. The bright bud of sun will rise and anew. You believe them. Thank you.